It is a joy for me to introduce Dr. Sam Kamalason to you this morning. I'm excited for two reasons. I got to have a class from him at the seminary when I was a student about, I think, six years ago. It kind of dates me, doesn't it? Um, but he was visiting at that point as a visiting faculty member, and he taught in the Department of Spiritual Life. Um, and so I got to interact with him some, and so I'm going to share with you a little bit of what I know about Dr. Kamalason that sets him apart. We all like to be set apart, right? Anybody in here doesn't want to be set apart? We all like to be set apart. That's how we're made. And so I will share with you a little bit of Dr. Kamalason. Dr. Kamalason has a deep bass voice. You will hear that very soon. It sounds really cool. That has always set him apart. As a college student in India, studying for a bachelor's degree in veterinary science, he was tempted with offers to make his fortune singing for the movies or in the world of opera. Sam, Dr. Sam Kamalason met Dr. J.T. Siemens in 1952. When Dr. Siemens heard Dr. Sam Kamalason sing, he encouraged him to use his voice for the glory of God. So when Dr. Sam Kamalason graduated from veterinary school in 1957, he had an opportunity to come and study at Asbury Theological Seminary, 1952. Remember that time. After, at Asbury, he received a Master of Divinity degree and then went back to serve in India in Bangalore. He later came back to the United States where he earned another Master's in Theology from Asbury Seminary and a Doctorate of Sacred Theology degree from the Emory University. Um, in following the Lord's plan for his life, Dr. Sam has been privileged to collect a lot of honors along the way. He has served as the Vice President at large for World Vision, and he has held several other positions in that same organization. He also holds an honorary doctorate from Asbury College, has received the Philip Award for Evangelism presented by the National Association of United Methodist Evangelists, and in 1989 was honored to be named as one of the 40 distinguished Methodist evangelists by the Foundation of Evangelism. So these are all the things that qualify uh, Dr. Sam Kamalason to be before you this morning. Those are just his achievements, but what really sets him apart is when I walked into chapel this morning, I said, Dr. Sam, what do you want me to say about you? And you're not gonna guess what he said to him. He said, just tell them I want to follow him. And I was kind of taken aback by the statement because he didn't say I need to follow him or I like to follow him, but he said I want to follow him. So let's open our hearts and minds to listen to Dr. Sam Kamalason, someone who wants to follow God. I'm privileged to be with you. No, that was not a put on. That's the real me. When we sang the hymn, Holy, 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 I remember just a few months ago, I sat in the church known as St. John's Church in a town called Trichinopoly in India. Close to where I was sitting, was a tombstone that said Bishop Reginald Heber was buried there. The one who wrote that hymn was an illustrious missionary. He lived in that town and died very young. He wrote many, many hymns. The best known of them is Holy, Holy, Holy. Lord God Almighty, probably the best worship hymn that ever will be written. I went to school at a school named after the bishop. My high school was at the Bishop Heber High School. I couldn't let 
such a glorious opportunity go unused for my claim to fame is that I went to school at a school named of the illustrious Bishop Bishop Reginald Heber Good morning to you Asbury I'm honored to be with you there is only one authentic ministry and that ministry belongs to Jesus of Nazareth and I want to read a few words that he spoke you have few Bibles if you care to follow will you turn with me to the gospel according to Saint Mark and the third chapter that's good you could do better than that wake up get that Bible and look into it you may see things that you never saw there before would you do that please one more time there are few Bibles if you are awake and we are on the third chapter of the Gospel according to Saint Mark and I'm reading from verse 23 of that chapter this is the new King James Version so he called them to him and said to them in parables how can Satan cast out Satan if a kingdom is divided against itself that kingdom cannot stand and if a house is divided against itself that house cannot stand and if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided he cannot stand but he has an end no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man then he will plunder his house the incidents is the explanation Jesus offered to those who wanted to short circuit his authority over the demonic he cast out demons because he had authority over them he cast out demons because one greater than the demons had come and the kingdom of God was affirming itself in the affairs of humanity but they accused him of doing this through the power of the devil and hence he said if you want to release those who are under the bondage of the demonic you need to first know how to bind him only then those who are enslaved by him can be brought into liberty all over the world the effort of Christian mission cannot succeed until it falls in line with the ministry the only authentic ministry there is the ministry of Jesus of Nazareth if you and I need to know how our lives may be invested profitably if the things that baffle us in human society are to be brought under control if the good that you know is the permanent good should triumph over the evil then we too need to know how to bind the strong one Jesus cast out the demon from those who were demon possessed sometimes the demon possessed people were sitting in the church the equivalent of the church in those days was the synagogue and when Jesus walked into a synagogue a man was already there who was under the control of the demonic just because we go to church are you awake just because we go to church it doesn't authenticate that we are under the right kind of Lordship how does one know to bind the strong one apart from casting out demons from people Jesus confronted the demonic at least three times in his own personal life I would like to talk to you Asbury 
as to how you can confront the demonic in your own life and bind him so that when you pray for the world you will pray with authority are you listening I didn't hear a word from you are you listening yeah, you can get bolder than that are you listening that's better we're getting there you can bind him but it has to be a confrontation in your life three times I said what are those three times the first one you will find in Luke Luke chapter 4 when Jesus confronts the demonic in the wilderness there is a parallel passage in Matthew but I'm not referring to it it is in Luke chapter 5 the, the Word of God says after he was baptized and he came out and the witness came from heaven that this is God's own son the Spirit himself the Holy Spirit caught him and took him into the wilderness 40 days he fasted it was a total fast at the end of the 40 day period the demonic came to him and it was the first one-on-one -on -one confrontation it was not an identity issue this time it was the implication or the application of this identity in the process of redemption you are the son of God he did not contest it at all you are born again he doesn't contest that but he tells you the energy of being born again the insights and the worthwhileness of that can be utilized in so many different ways this was the contention in the first encounter not the identity but the application and the implication of that identity three ways he tested him the first was to say you are the son of God you have the authority take the stone make make it bread you are hungry it will feed you and if the word gets around every Tom Dick and Harry and Mary Jane and whoever it is will come after you because if it is free food nobody can resist it too long <laughs> in ministry listen to me Asbury in ministry the number one problem is are there ways in which we can win people to Christ that are not authenticated by his ministry one of them would be why not we meet just their physical needs that will get them make the stone bread what was the appeal the appeal was to appetite the bondage that we have because we are bound to a sarcus a body it's not unreal it's very real but if the reality is overplayed you are in trouble because the body is a good servant but a very poor master if you reverse the priority and make your appetite rule you the demonic has got you whatever else you may do or not do the demonic has bound you you can't bind him because you're playing in his team the first appeal is to appetite and appetite is not just for the variety that we have in the cafeteria for a few evenings my wife and I have enjoyed the variety in Asbury's cafeteria and it's amazing whether you believe it or not <laughs> you're awake aren't you who is not awake when you talk about food <laughs> it is not merely the appetite of the body that is associated with food but lust is also the same appetite you want to be an authentic follower of Christ you want to do something redemptive to the world be assured unless you know how to bind him with the appetites associated with your body he has got you bound how did Jesus answer him man is not just the body the Word of God is what vitalizes him and he will not live merely by the body 
But, but the priority, Pauline priority would be your reawakened spirit when you're born again in communion with his spirit. And then your mind under the control of the values that that spirit context will establish. And that value system ruling your body. The body is not to be treated as if it is not important because the word became flesh. But if you prioritize your body as a primary thing, you are bound. You can't bind him. The second time he came to him, he took him to some very lofty place from which he could show him the kingdoms of the world. I'm sure he talked about New Delhi, about Washington, D.C., maybe about Frankfurt, Kentucky also. And he said, yeah, I rule all of this. Hands down, I rule them. You want access to them? Fall at my feet, I'll give it to you. What is the second appeal? If the first one was appetite, the second appeal was avarice, greed, uncontrollable greed. We have sanctified greed in our market economy, made it appear as if it is a gift from God. And in a consumerist environment, greed is the motivation, whether you like it or not, that keeps the system going. Asbury, are you listening to me? I didn't hear you. Yes. That's better. It could be better. Even. Are you listening? Yes. In a consumerist society, not anyone is free from this. Greed, runaway greed, has killed the possibilities of an economy that could have been safer than what it is now. But it's not about others. The scapegoating will not help us in ministry. What about us? Fall at my feet and I will give it to you. How did the Son of God, whose ministry alone is the authentic ministry, how did he overcome the demonic? How did he bind him? He simply said, I bend my knee to only one authentic man knows to whom worship is due and he will not bend his knee to any other authority whatever it might be greed being one of them and then he said using that authority get behind me and the demonic tucked his tail and just left amazing authority you and i still have this authority because the one reason the second man, Adam, came is to set us free so that we can live authentic human existence. And it is not bound to greed. The third time he came to him and he took him to the pinnacle of the temple and he showed him the multitude standing below. And he said, you know and I know that until the cross becomes a reality, your father will not let you destroy your life. So jump, take the risk, and he will send his angels to sweep you. And man, what a show that will be. Spectacular, impressive. And you will have your intention met. Your ambition is to captivate the attention of mankind into the redemptive work that you would do. This will be a prelude to that, and you will have your audience. What is he saying? He is saying, ambition, make your ambition your God. Use God to fulfill your ambition. After all, ambition is not wrong. There is no story in the Bible that tells you that ambition is wrong. Right from Joseph onwards, the story illustrates point after point that a life without ambition is empty. Where the people don't have a vision, they perish. What then is God trying to tell us if your ambition runs away with you and becomes your God and you're using God merely 
to win your ambition ultimately, then you are in deep trouble. Because God is no longer God, your ambition has become God and the demonic has bound you. Asbury, are you listening? That's better. You're increasingly into it. And I'm thankful to God for that. First, listen. First, it is appetite. It includes lust. Second, it is avarice, greed, the runaway greed that has put us all into a mess. It's not out there. It's in here. Third, it is ambition. Ambition sanctified so holy that even God in our minds is a means to get at our ambition. You will never serve the world when you let your ambition control you. Jesus said you will not test the Lord your God. The second time the demonic came to him was in the garden. When he went in to pray, in Matthew's account, two times he goes in to pray. The first time he prays and said, Father, let this cup go away, if it is your will. And then he comes back outside and goes back the second time, and this time he says, Father, the cup is from your hands. I take it from you. There is an acceptance. I don't know how many of you have ever attended daily vacation Bible school. By your silence, nobody did. Have you? Good. You remember the song, so high, you can't get over it so deep. You can't get under it so wide. You can't get round it. Not a one remembers it. What is it about? What is that song about? What is so high that you can't get over it? Love of God is right. One good man. I salute you, sir. Love of God is right. You can't get over it. You can't get under it. You can't get around it. You've got to go through it. But that's not the only thing. He was only eight years old. He was one of our six grandchildren, brilliant as could be. We called him Jonathan. The day when we were getting ready to leave, my wife and I, he sat on my foot and clung to my calf, and I carried him like that from room to room. He looked at me, make some joke and laugh at me, and then he would say, Tata, which means grandfather, why do you take a mama, mother's mother, which is his grandmother? Why do you take her with you? You can go alone. Leave her behind. <laughs> His amma kept food ready for him when he came from school. <laughs> Utility value. <laughs> I laughed at him and we left. We... <laughs> I'm absolutely tickled you're so awake this morning. <laughs> because when the first hymn was announced, a few of you were so deeply involved in yawning. I didn't know whether you were here or there. Good morning, Asbury. <laughs> we left and we arrived in Aijol, the capital city of a state called Mizoram in India for a pastor's conference. There was a telephone call and it came from my daughter, Jonathan's mother. She said, Dad, they have found a growth at the base of his brain. And it's too deep. And it's malignant. We finished the conference as quickly as we could. The airline made arrangements for us to fly back. When I arrived in Los Angeles, we went straight to the hospital. They had already done one surgery on Johnny. On my way, I kept calling him 
And we talked. He kept telling me, Tata, there is something in my brain. And they're going to take it out. And I would ask him, shall I pray? An eight-year-old finds faith very easy. Johnny was strong. Johnny and I prayed many times while I was traveling. Three months, Johnny lived. It got into the internet, and people from all over the world were praying. But in three months, Johnny went to be with the Lord. So high, you can't get over it. So deep, you can't get under it. So wide, you can't get around it. Father, this cup is from you. How can I say no? You want to follow him in the authentic ministry. When a disaster comes to you, how do you react? Do you go out and sit by the road saying, why did he do it to me? Are you there this morning? You want to bind him? Follow him. He did it. He did it. This cup is from you, Father. I don't want to go around it. I'll go through it. The third time the demonic confronted him was on the cross. And I want to now move from prose to poetry. A Scottish minister wrote the scene in poetry. He said he was strung upon a piece of wood hanging between heaven and earth, the Son of God himself. And all the demonic forces were dancing around the foot of the cross. And they were saying, we got you. You came to express the kind of love that man can never know by himself. C.S. Lewis says, there are four kinds of love known to mankind. Three of them, man can generate himself. The Eros love, the friendship love, and the family love. But agape love, the love that does not keep accounts at all, the love that knows no aggression, man cannot generate it by himself. It has to be lived through by God himself. Otherwise, we will know nothing about this love. The only point in history where we saw this enacted irrefutably was on the cross. When the demonic jumped all around and said, we got you, they said, look what they have done to you. You came to express the kind of love that they will never know by themselves. You brought something that mankind could not generate, could not produce. And look what they have done to you. They have not only rejected you, they have pinned you to the tree. We got you. And then the Scottish minister says, he looked down from the tree and said, is this the nth degree rejection you can do? And they said, yes. And then he said, you don't have me, I got you. When you've done the worst and I can forgive you, you don't have me, I've got you. Asbury, are you listening? Staines was his name, and he came from Australia to be a missionary in India. Thirty-six years, he and his wife gave their lives for lepers in one of the less developed parts of my country, a state called Orissa. Thirty-six years. They had three children, a lovely girl and then two little boys. One night, when he was sleeping in the jeep, in a forest area with his two boys, they poured gasoline on the jeep and burnt the two boys and Mr. Staines alive. The country was appalled. Everywhere the story was the story of the cross. 
the funeral, the song that they sang was, Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. And the television interviewed her, and they said, Do you hate the man who did this? She said, No. They said, Unbelievable. How can that be? She said, My God has a timing for everyone. The time for my husband and two little boys had come. I have no hatred. Then they asked her, Will you go back to Australia, home? She said, Where is home for me and my daughter? Our home is here. These are our people. A man wrote in the newspaper, I mean, this hit India as no other news had hit her. I know. A man wrote to the newspaper and said, this is authentic spirituality. And then he said as a footnote, I'm not a Christian. Father, forgive them, but they don't know what they are doing. Asbury, bitterness entertained becomes hatred. Would you listen to me? Where does bitterness come? It comes out of a hurt. If you nourish hurt, hurt becomes bitterness. And if you nourish bitterness, bitterness becomes hatred. Once you have nourished it to the state of hatred, you are not in control. It is in control. Wake up. Some of you are closing your eyes, thinking others will think you're praying. That's good. That's good. Two of them woke up that time. That's very good. You'll hate my guts by the time I finish. And that's good too. Are you listening, Asbury? Hurt, nourished, becomes bitterness. Where does it come from? You permitted it. Bitterness, nourished, becomes hatred. Once you let it get that far, you are not in control, my dear brother, my dear sister. You think you are. It is in control. Pastors Conference in a town called Darjeeling in India. Some of the best tea in the world comes from Darjeeling. It was for the, for the pastors of Nepal. In Nepal, there is no organized church officially. But the Nepalis are becoming Christians in a very, very powerful way. Many of those congregations surround the border of Nepal in India. So this was for the Nepali pastors. Nepalis are the people from whom the Gurkhas come. I don't know if you know about that word Gurkha at all. They are great warriors. Not very tall, but enormously powerful fighters. Both Britain and India still maintain battalions of them. When they go to war, they carry in their attire a bent sword. It's called a cookery. I mean, even in these days of automatic weaponry, this is still a regular part of their uniform. Why? Because traditionally, a Gurkha soldier, when he's in armed conflict with his enemy, will not use the, the automatic weaponry, but he'll draw that sword. Once it is unsheathed, you can't put it in the sheath again without human blood on it. What happens if your enemy escapes? You've got to cut your hand, put your blood before you sheath it. Bitterness is like this. The person against whom you feel the bitterness, you can't touch the person. You're in will more. They could be as far away in Boston or maybe in Timbuktu. There is really a Timbuktu. <laughs> I've been there. It's in Mali, in Africa. You can't do a thing to them. Every time you feel bitter, you're cutting yourself. The problem is, how do I sheath this sword? I've unsheathed it. Run to Calvary. 
Only the blood of Jesus Christ has the power to sheet hatred. Asbury, are you listening to me? Yes. It's too important a movement for me to let it to be a chance. Three ways you can bind the demonic. Appetite. Lust included. Avarice. Uncontrolled greed being your only motivation. Young people, be careful. You will destroy yourself. Ambition. You make ambition your God and you're using God as a means to get at it. You know you're doing it. But the game will be played against you. And then there are some experiences. You can't go around. You got to go through. Are you griping? Are you sitting there and blaming him and telling yourself, I did so much for him. What did he do for me? Get up. Get up, bind the demonic, go through manfully, like a courageous lady that you are, face him and say, I bind you in the name of Jesus. Move on, because the most, the only authentic ministry belongs to Jesus Christ. Yours is authenticated only to the extent to which it conforms to his ministry, not otherwise. And finally, who binds hatred in a world of hatred? Who binds hatred? Who has the power to say, I bind you? Father, forgive them. Run, run to Calvary because you're bleeding. Is all of this story or does it really happen? In Revelation chapter 12, in the book of Revelation, chapter 12. Come on, Asbury, it's not my exercise, it's your exercise too. Verse 11. Revelation, chapter 12, verse 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of the testimony, and they did not love their lives even unto death. Who are the day here? They are those who have crossed over, Mr. Staines included. They are the ones who are on the other side. What are they saying to us? It can be done. You can bind him. How did they do it? They did it by three things. Number one, the blood of the lamb. Victory is at the foot of the cross. It's nothing that you and I have done that earns our right to bind the demonic. It's what God has done through his son, as his son, Jesus of Nazareth. The power is at Calvary. It's the blood of the lamb. It's not smartness. It's the wisdom of God. There's a big difference, Asbury, between being smart and being wise. By all means, acquire all the knowledge. Be the greatest you can be in the skills that you are acquiring. But let the wisdom of God control you and use you in the deployment of the skills that you are acquiring. The blood of the Lamb. The second thing, the word of testimony. If he has done it to me at the right time, in the appropriate moment, contextually, properly, I need to say this is true. And he has shattered the bondage and set me free. And he can do it for you too. A word of testimony. And then finally, they did not love their lives even to death. How is that done? There was a man called E. Stanley Jones. A man went to school like you are doing here now at Asbury. A man I knew. A man that is respected wherever people want to follow the authentic Christ. When he made his first trip to India, he had to take a boat from North America to London and then change the boat and sail from London to Bombay, which is now called 
which now is called Mumbai. On that journey, there was a British Army chaplain, seasoned by working in India for many years. He saw that this young American missionary needed to know some of the paces so that he wouldn't get overwhelmed in India, and he helped him along. At one point, they were serving whiskey, and then when it came to Jones, he said, no, I don't. And the army chaplain picked up one for himself, and then he advised Mr. Jones, you don't drink? And Jones said, no, I don't. And the man said, let me give you a good advice. Without whiskey, you can't survive in India. What's the implication? Obviously, the implication is such a hell of a place. That's bad language at chapel. <laughs> it's such an awful place that you need whiskey to drown your feelings. Good argument for drinking. Are you listening? Yeah, yeah, they have some very good arguments. And what did Jones say? Jones told him, if without whiskey I will die, let me die. I have an option. Man, I don't have to sell my values in order to survive. I want to live. If authentic living is my goal, then dying should not be scary. I have a value system that transcends physical death. Hallelujah. Is this true this morning? Can you bind him? Would you like to? Would you like to say yes? In the name of Jesus, through the blood of the Lamb, because of the power of the blessed Holy Spirit, I will. I will authenticate my life by conforming to the only authentic life, the life of Yesu of Nazareth. Appetite, avarice, ambition, and that which the Father gives me, and to bind hatred with a love stronger than hatred, yes, I will. I'd like to lead you in closing prayer. During that prayer time, if you would say, Brother Sam, God spoke to me this morning. I can't walk out of this chapel as if nothing happened. I want to say yes to him. Will you pray with me also? If you would say that, when we bow our heads and close our eyes, would you like to stand up? You don't have to wait for people to close eyes to stand up. You can do it right now. But when we pray, if you want to join with this prayer, would you stand up wherever you are seated? Shall we pray? Yes, 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 yes. Are there others? Unless you bind the strong one. You cannot lead those who are under his bondage into freedom. Yes, yes, yes. Unfortunately, I can't wait forever because the clock is ticking. If you want to, would you stand now along with these? Yes. Let me pray with you. Father in heaven, you, you see much deeper than any one of us can. And now you're looking at intents and hearts and minds and lives, our whole life open before you. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, may it be applied right now. And may that which no power can ever prevent, that energy, God's forgiving grace descend upon our hearts. And may the bondage break, that may the power of the indwelling presence of the blessed Holy Spirit be unleashed in every one of our lives, hesitant as we are, because we are bound by a past history. 
But today, by the blood of the everlasting covenant, that history is broken. To you, we yield. From you, we receive. For you, we want to live. Father, answer our prayer. For we pray through the name that you cannot refuse. He's your son. You cannot refuse him. We pray in the name that we cannot refuse because he is our Savior and our Lord. Father in heaven, we pray this prayer in the name of God's Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Please be seated. And the Lord go with you and bless you and keep you. He can be bound. Bind him in the name of Jesus. And then through your life, he will bind, unbind those who are being dominated by him. God bless you, Asbury.